was in awe of how um, Sky has created Circle Harvest and what a sustainable business that it is. Sky is a um, entomologist and a food scientist, and she's put that together with her passion for sustainability. And I think you'll agree after you see the presentation that she's a real future thinker, innovative, <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a real thrill to be doing this on National Ag Day. So over to you, Sky. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to that, Liz. <laughs> Just... <laughs> All right. So um, uh, what we're going to be learning a little bit about today is um, our edible insect farm. So in 2007, I founded Australia's first edible insect farm called the Edible Bug Shop, which some of you might have heard about before. Um, where is it? Just located in Western Sydney. So we're an urban farm um, and... We've been doing this for quite a long time now, so it's fantastic that we're seeing people's perceptions around food kind of change and the sustainability message kind of coming to the forefront now. Um, farming edible insects is kind of a weird job. Um, <laughs> I, I do have to say that. Um, but um, I'm actually a food scientist and an entomologist, which is a very unique combination of skills. I can pretty confidently say that I am the only entomologist slash food scientist in the world. Um, and uh, we started farming insects after a trip to Thailand. So when we went to Thailand, as you do, we tried edible insects for the very first time. Um, and when we came back from Thailand, we we're actually doing a pet and animal expo for part of our education business. So in our education business, we teach people all about the importance of bugs in our ecosystems. We go around to schools and teach children about life cycles and things like that. Um, and we were doing a special expo and I wanted something that was a little bit unique to um, uh, to kind of promote our stands and to get people to come over and start to talk to us. So I called my little brother and said, you know, I want to make these lollipops that have real bugs on the inside. And he was probably about 15 at the time. He just said, sure. So we made a thousand of these lollipops that had um, crickets and mealworms and little scorpions and ants and things like that, that we had farmed ourselves in, um, in the back room, in the sunroom. And we sold out within two hours of those lollipops, which was amazing. So um, I didn't really think anything of it, but after the day, we were getting calls from the newspaper, marketing companies, lolly shops all around Australia that had heard about our lollipops and wanted to stock them. So being a food scientist, I automatically thought, oh, okay, we can make these bug lollipops all the time. But um, we need some nutritional information to go on the back of the packet. So I sent away some quick get some mealworms for nutritional testing in a laboratory. And when I got the results back, I was absolutely shocked. I was shocked that no one was eating them as a source of food because they were just like a little superfood. They had everything that your body could possibly need in this little tiny package. And I thought, you know what? I have the perfect combination of skills to convince people that this is a good idea. And I've spent the past 14 years convincing people that this is a good idea, right? <laughs> um, which could be uh, like, maybe it could be visionary, maybe it could be a touch of crazy, um, but I'm going to take you through our journey a little bit now and you can kind of decide at the end whether it was a visionary move or a crazy move, <laughs> right? So, um, we, as I said, we're located in Western Sydney. So what we actually do is we convert unused warehouses into urban vertical edible insect farms. The main insects that we farm are crickets and mealworms, and we farm those in large numbers. Um, but we do also farm a few other types of insects, specifically for chefs, so normally for um uh, like some of the, the world's top chefs, so things like ants or grasshoppers and giant water bugs and scorpions and things like that. But the main ones that we farm that we're going to be feeding the world with are definitely the crickets and the mealworms. Um, how we actually farm them is we actually take um, fruit and vegetable waste that would normally go to landfill. So we get this waste from um, food manufacturing. We get it directly from farm. So it might be that ugly fruit and veg that um, you guys can't sell to the supermarkets. Um, and then we actually 
use that as feed for our insects. So we're circling that back into our food system. Um, and that whole process of going from an egg to a stage where we would harvest the insects is actually only about four to six weeks. So it doesn't take us very long to be able to come up with a usable food product in the end as well. Um, and we do have a lot of different applications for the, um, the crickets and the mealworms that we're farming as well. So we have opportunities in um, pet food and animal feed markets, and you might have already started to see some uh, like dog and cat food that uses insect-based proteins in there as well. Um, we can use, turn them into a fertilizer product and we can use them as waste management as well. So there's this awesome company called GoTerra, they're located in Canberra. They actually have these special maggot robots um, and all you do is you put your food waste into the into the robot. The robot does everything for you. It feeds um, the black soldier fly larva. They then the the larva turn that into uh, a, like break down the food, and then that's turned into a fertilizer product. So that's all automated. So what she's really doing is decentralizing waste management and saving all that amazing food from landfill, and it gets turned into an awesome fertilizer product, which is amazing. Um, and then what we really focus on is human food production. So there's not a lot of companies in the world that actually focus on um, insects for human food production, but um, we've been quite successful at it. Um, I suppose the unique combination of skills that I have kind of is helpful with that. But um, we're going to focus a little bit on um, the food production side of things today. So. When we're talking about uh, something like a cricket protein powder, it is underselling it a little bit because it's not just protein. So if we have a cricket protein powder, for instance, it's 69% digestible protein. So um, if you have a tablespoon of cricket protein, that's about 13 grams of protein in there. So it's really, really protein packed. Um, it's about 50% more digestible than whey protein as well. Um, and we have enzymes in our guts that are there to digest the types of proteins that are found in insects so it's actually really really good for our bodies it won't leave you bloated like a whey protein might um, but besides the protein it's more like a superfood it has so many good things in it so it's packed full of essential micronutrients so things like iron calcium magnesium um, manganese potassium phosphorus and zinc in there it's really high in b12s which is really important for our bodies it has a complete amino acid profile it's really low in carbs and fats and it's got the perfect omega-3 omega-6 ratio as well so we've got um four times as much calcium as milk, twice as much iron as spinach, three times as much omega-3 as salmon. Um, if you've got that tablespoon that we talked about before, that's got half of your daily B12 in there. It's got 100% of your zinc and 100% of your magnesium intake in there. So um, the challenge kind of that I had was how to take these little cricket and mealworms in a lollipop and kind of convince people that we should be eating insects for the nutrition rather than for novelty and it's been a 14 year process <laughs> so we're going to start off with a little bit of a hop quiz so um just think about it to yourself a little bit i want you to read these and we're going to think about which one is a real food ad that they've used in the past so the first one is ddt it's good for me it sounds like that could be real <laughs> um drinking wine will help cure your depression um and adding soft drink to your baby's bottles is good for them so i'll just give you a little minute to think about it so we've got three good options there but I have to say that I was tricking you because all of those are real food ads from the 1950s and 1960s. But this is one that I really wanted to focus on for you guys. And I know the text is really, really small, so I'm going to tell you what it says. So what the text actually says is this young man is 11 months old and he isn't our youngest customer by any means the seven up is so pure so wholesome you can even give it to babies and feel good about it look at the back of a seven up bottle we list all the ingredients which isn't a requirement of soft drinks you know and hey mum if your toddler likes to be coaxed to drink their milk try this 
add seven up in equal parts, pouring in the seven up slowly and your toddler will love it. Make seven up your family drink. So let's just have a little bit of a minute to digest that. In the 1950s, totally okay to feed a, an 11 month old um, seven up and they actually advertised to customers in this way. The same as they advertised that DDT was good for people and the same way that they advertised that stay at home mum should drink wine to cure their depression. Just as consumers have changed their mind about giving soft drink to babies in a little baby's bottle, consumers have now changed their mind about insect proteins as food as well, as lots of different kinds of foods. So we are actually changing the way that we eat and this is coming through education. So um, what we advocate for is a complete diet. Uh, so this includes meat, this includes plants and vegetables, this includes some of the new things that we're looking at for the future of food as well. So our diet is moving more towards a flexitarian diet, which really means that it's a person that eats mostly vegetables, but sometimes they eat meat or fish or poultry. Um, and that's really the way that things are going. We're going to be eating much more plants, a little bit less meat, but and that's because there won't be enough meat for everybody. The way that we farm our meat won't be able to keep up with this population. So it's a good idea to spread it around so that everybody can have some. It's a really, really important part of our diet. To help supplement that, um, insects play a really important role. Um, Personalised nutrition is on the rise as well. So we're seeing um, your diet personalized to your body and the needs of your body. We've got new kinds of farms that are coming out. So um, we're farming things like algae and seaweed in the oceans, which is amazing. I think that process is so awesome. Um, insects, which we've been speaking about before, we're seeing a huge um, demand on plants and plant-based diet and a lot of urban agriculture and vertical farms are going in. Um, another thing that's a, a long way off at the moment is cellular agriculture. Um, um, but that will also play an important role in the future of food, along with the other things that we've spoken about. So I know that we're speaking about eating insects, and I know that sounds a little bit scary, but when we um, talk about a steak, we don't call it a cow. It doesn't look like a cow anymore. So very early on in the piece, I decided that we wouldn't be eating insects as a whole insect as you can imagine there's no legs or wings or antennae in the things that you'll be eating in the future so think about having a bag of corn chips with more protein than an egg or devouring some delicious chocolate pancakes for your breakfast in the morning that have half of your daily iron intake or chowing down at a delicious burger that's got all of your omega-3s for the day the addition of insect-based ingredients did all that. So what we actually do is we create familiar foods that you would eat every day. We just enrich them with invisible insect protein. So this can be in the form of powders, oils, paste, um, even milks and lipids that we can produce. Uh, we have a textured insect protein product as well. So you can make things like burgers and sausages and mints. Really, the possibilities are endless with the things that you can make. Um, and it's easy for consumers to make a switch. So instead of buying a bag of Doritos that don't really have that much nutrition in them, you can buy, just switch it out for a bag of cricket protein corn chips that's packed full of iron and B12 and amino acids and the protein that's in there as well. It keeps your body fuller for longer. You're getting that salty snack that you really, really wanted, but, um, you're having protein in a different way. You don't need to be eating um, a steak, chowing down on a steak to be having protein. You can be eating a chocolate chip cookie and you can be having your protein. That's what we're looking at is different ways of including protein in the products that consumers already buy. 
risk. So over the past 14 years, you can imagine we've had lots and lots of different kinds of products. And 14 years ago, when we first started, people were definitely not ready for insects as a source of food. Um, we kind of, even though we've had our end game in mind the whole time, we, people weren't ready to buy a, a burger that's made out of crickets. So we did do things like lollipops and chocolate coated bugs and things like that, which really helped us to get our message out there. Uh, we use those things to get the um, attention of the media. So we've been capitalising on that media. We've been working with Australia's top chefs to get insect proteins onto menus all around the country. People are now more aware that insects deliver more nutrition with every mouthful and they want these kinds of products on shelves. So we've evolved and we've stopped making lollipops now, <laughs> but um, our, kind of our first brand was this Vitabug brand, which kind of says what it is. Um, and that was under our Edible Bug Shop logo. So you can see we still did have things like our protein burger mix, we had pasta, um, we had the chips and things like that as well. Um, but it wasn't very consumer friendly packaging on there. So what we were so lucky because in 2019 we were chosen by mars to be part of the mars seeds of change accelerator program which um was so fantastic for us so being part of this program well all, all of our staff are scientists so we knew that our branding wasn't very good we knew that our packaging wasn't very good but being scientists we didn't really know how to fix it and um, we just kind of were stuck in this rut for a very long time until we became part of this program. They asked us what we needed help with. So basically, I went in and said, branding and marketing, that's where we need help. And they were amazing. They gave us the team that does all the master foods packaging and branding. They work with IKEA and Yahoo and all of these Smith chips, all of these huge brands. And they actually developed this brand new brand for us that's called Circle Harvest. So it was a very long process. Um, they interviewed all of our staff, they interviewed our customers, um, found out what was important to them, what is important to our customers, what's important to our staff, what messages can we bring across. Um, so as you can see on our logo, we have the sun because we love to use solar energy. We have that circle in there because we are using a circular system as well. And you can see we do have a cute little um, cricket and some mealworms on there as well. So we, we needed to have the crickets on there. I feel like that's important because that's kind of our unique selling point is the cricket proteins. Um, so now we have these products available in stores around Australia. So at the moment, we're probably in around 30 stores stores and after Christmas we're going into about another 100 stores so at the moment you can find us um, like Dan Murphy's online a lot of the IGA groups have them in um, after Christmas we're going into uh, Harris Farm and places like that which is super super exciting and this year we've actually despite the pandemic we've had an amazing response from retailers and from consumers that are coming in and buying these products on shelf because one of the things that um, was really hard for me was choosing the, me the messages that go on the pack. We sell a lot of products through our website, but the people that come to our website um, are already looking to make a purchase. They've already learned about insect-based proteins from somewhere and they, look, they want to try it. And on our website, there's also lots and lots of information about that on the website. So it was hard for me to kind of give that up and put it on a shelf because that means that our chips are next to a packet of Smith's salt and vinegar chips and they're next to a packet of CC's on the other side. So what is going to make someone pick up our chips and put that in their lunchbox instead of taking a bag of CC's? And I love CC's, they're delicious, right? But they're not very good for you. 
but now I actually went to um, a, a school at Bondi just before we got closed down for the pandemic and during the um, presentation I actually asked the students if anybody has tried insect proteins before and five of the children put up their hands to say they had tried insects before and normally I only get one or two so I was very intrigued and I kind of said to them you know what have you guys tried before and they said oh my mum goes to the shop across the road and goes and buys cricket corn chips and puts them in my lunchbox and the little kid pulls out his packet of cricket corn chips from the um from the lunchbox which was an awesome experience and now we have schools around Australia as well that are including um, we've got a cookie that we're supplying to schools a high protein cookie that's got no sugar in it as well as the cricket protein corn chips are in canteens which is amazing um, I can see that there is um, a a question about smoothies. So we actually do have a protein powder that you can add into smoothies or you can add it into your um, your cookies or your curries or your stir fries and you just add a tablespoon in there but you're just increasing the nutrition. So the cricket protein powder itself isn't, um, it doesn't dissolve so it isn't soluble. So normally that's why we would be looking to add it to different kinds of food. So as you can see we've got a brownie mix, a cookie mix, a pancake mix that you can make at home. We've got pastas, we've actually got a gluten-free pasta that's coming out this week as well which is amazing. Um, so now um, we're thinking about why now. Why now is insect protein so important and why now should it be available in supermarkets? So traditionally farming insects has been a very expensive um, form of farming. So as you can imagine it takes quite a long time to go and you need to feed and clean and monitor the insects all by hand. So there's lots and lots of people that are doing the, that go into making a kilo of cricket protein and that is reflected in the price. So what we've actually been doing over the past 14 years is engineering uh, robotics and artificial intelligence that help us to farm the insects in a more efficient way. So instead of taking 10 people to, to farm the insects on their insect side of things, we have our warehouse that this is our new warehouse that we're actually moving into in a few weeks time, which is very, very exciting. Um, so we have our warehouse. And what we do is we have special enclosures that we have developed that holds about 10 kilos of cricket protein per enclosure. Um, and that helps us to separate the crickets so that if there's an issue with health or an issue with the food, then we're able to identify that quickly and it doesn't spread through our whole colony. Um, and we can use all these little um, enclosures and put them all over the space that we have. But the benefits of insect farming is we don't just need to use the floor space. We can actually use the space above the space as well because we can stack these specially designed enclosures on top of each other. So that means that we've got cricket protein not just on the floor but all the way up into the roof. So after we've kind of got this design, we needed to make a robot. So the robot feeds and cleans and monitors the insects as well as harvests them. It actually harvests them as well when they get to be the right size. But as you can see, he doesn't have very good reach. He can only kind of wheel around on the floor. So what we've done is we've made him a lot smaller, but he can then go on the sides and go up and down and across to feed and clean and monitor the insects in their little tubs. But because we've got a lot of insects, it takes them a very long time. So now what we've done is we've made teeny tiny ones that use the enclosures to go along the enclosures. And then um, each one will feed and clean and monitor a lot more quickly and harvest a lot more quickly than one big robot can do. So because we've got all these little robots, they are very expensive to set up and they were very expensive to develop. But that means that instead of having 10 people to look after the farm, we've actually just got one person that really looks after the robots. So 
with the benefits of scale and the, the benefits of developing these technologies, what we've actually been able to do is take out the biggest cost for our production, which is the price, which is the um, price of the human interaction that they have. So now that means that we have a product that we can manufacture in bulk, um, we can supply that to food manufacturers. We can supply that um, in our own food products as well at a price that's comparable to other protein sources, for instance, um, pea protein or chickpea protein. But it's a higher value product because it is higher in every kind of nutrition that you can think of. Um, when we have our... Uh, system as well, um, it is a very resilient system that we've been developing. So it's very sustainable and very resilient, which is the kind of farming that we need to be able to support our future population. So um, regenerative agriculture does this really, really well. So as we spoke about before, we take our fruit and vegetable waste from food production processing and we use that to feed our crickets and our mealworms. Um, 100% of the crickets and mealworms is actually edible product. So none of the, the mass of the insects is going to waste. For each 10 kilos of feed that we give them, um, we get nine kilos of edible insects. And that's because insects don't waste a lot of energy maintaining a set body temperature like us silly mammals do. They kind of go with the flow. So. Um, when you go into our cricket farm, it's very, very noisy and it's very, very hot and it's very, very humid. So it's like going to Bali in the middle of summer. But that's the way the crickets like it. And if it's noisy, it means that they're very happy. And But there is one kind of product that we do have that is a waste product, and that is insect poo, which is called insect frass. Now, the frass product is an excellent fertilizer. It is nitrogen and phosphorus rich. So we actually send that back to the farms that supply us with their ugly fruit and veg, and they use that as a fertilizer product. Um, and as you guys probably all know, fertilizer is going up. There's going to be a shortage of fertilizer coming up. So something like using an insect-based um, fertilizer is something that is going to be very, very desirable to farmers. And from the crickets, then we then have all of these amazing food products that we can kind of um, – uh, that we can kind of manufacture. The, the possibilities are really, really endless. So something that um, we've been working really, really hard on for the past 14 years is education. So with any kind of new food, um, a, a good example is hemp. So everybody knows that hemp is this amazing food product and you see hemp seeds on the shelf in all of the um in all of the supermarkets, but does anybody really know how to use hemp? There wasn't a lot of education that goes behind it. So you know that hemp is really good for you, but what do you do with hemp? That's kind of a similar similar problem that we're having with the insect protein. So we don't feel like the way forward is to put a, um, a cricket protein powder on the shelves. The way forward is to show people how to eat insects by including it in familiar foods. And what we actually do with our education program is we've been going into schools for more than 14 years and we teach them about the future of food. So that includes regenerative agriculture, that includes waste management, that includes cellular agriculture and algae and new water technologies as well. And um, we've actually seen more than, it's actually up to 1.3 million students have come through our Future Food Education Program. So they have a better, better understanding of our food system than their parents and their grandparents. And we actually have um, adults that come now and um, our customers that have been through our program. I was actually in the supermarket with my three little kids all in the trolley because I've got three that are very close together. And this man came and tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I was the bug lady. 
Um, to I replied, yes, I am that bug lady. Um, and he said that when he was in year six, he I came to his school and taught him about insect proteins. And now he's a customer of ours because it's something that he really believes in too. And I almost fell on the floor and burst into tears. I was just so happy because when you go to schools and you teach students about the future of food and kind of what that looks like, um, what um, what meaning does that have to them? Do they take that away with them? And that kind of showed me that they really, really did take something away and that we are really making a big difference. Um, I'm sorry for the banging. I'm just going to tell them to be quiet. <laughs> We're having some construction going on, which is very exciting, but um, they're being a bit noisy. Wow. Guys, doing that. So you can, if you want to, you can unmute yourself if you don't feel like um, typing in the chat, or you can type in the chat if that's more helpful. Oh, we've got some people typing in the chat, so we'll just wait a second. If if I might say, if you can hear me, I can't see the chat at all on my screen. Uh, that's okay. Um, it's got like a little uh, a little speech bubble box. Depending if you're on your phone or on your laptop or um, on your iPad, it's got a little speech bubble box. So if you press that, then it'll bring the um, the chat out. That's what I'm saying. There is no speech bubble box on my computer screen oh okay that's okay you can just unmute and ask me if you've got questions yeah i can see the raised hand but there is no chat bubble box on my screen oh, okay. feel free to ask a question thank you well, one question i do have while there's a pause is why you're using microsoft um, this Microsoft software rather than the more established Zoom, was there a reason for it? <laughs> well, that would be my uh, question aimed at me and um, local land services has been um, working with teams and this is a trial for us to see how it works as a webinar. It, well, so if I can provide some feedback on that, um, it's it, having used Zoom and being new new to Teams, Teams took a lot for me to install through Microsoft. I even had to send my email address, my password to Microsoft, and I already have a Microsoft email account, so I was already in it. So it took me about five attempts to get in through this Teams, whereas Zoom, just from my experience, runs relatively seamlessly with the chat box that I can find. Thank you very much for that feedback, and we will take that on board in future webinars that we host. Thanks. Thank you. So I do see some um, uh, questions about uh, export. So I might move to our next slide because that's kind of what we're going to be talking about next is what is happening next in the insect protein space. So, um, so at the moment, we're actually expanding our farm. So we're on a, a 200 square metre facility at the moment, which is getting way too small. Um, we absolutely cannot keep up with the demand for our insect protein. So we're raising capital at the moment to be able to move into a new 2000 square metre facility, which is very, very exciting for us. Um, and what that will do is it will further bring down the cost of production, make the um, this product more accessible to food manufacturers. So we've already got partnerships in place with some very, very large food manufacturers that are starting to include insect-based proteins in the um, in their product ranges that will be on shelf, which is a fantastic opportunity, as well as a lot of um, fast food chains. So you might have noticed that some of the fast food chains will have a plant based burger and things like that. So um, in the future, they'll be having things like a flexitarian burger, which will be either a half beef and half insect based burger or a half plant and half insect based burger, which is really, really exciting. Um, Next year, we're continuing our rollout into Australian retail as well. 
um, and we're starting to export to Asia and the US, which is really, really exciting for us. Um, we actually use a lot of Australian native ingredients in our products. So we have uh, like a salt bush and rosemary corn chips, a lemon myrtle and saffron pasta, um, a chocolate chip and wattle seed cookie mix. So it'll be fantastic to be able to introduce these um, to, you know, the Asia and the US as well, because um, they haven't tried these unique Australian flavours. Um, it's funny because as we're going through, the, I thought that the, um, the insect-based proteins would be the difficult ingredient to get approved, but it's actually the Australian native ingredients will, are difficult to get approved for sale, especially in Asia, because they don't really have a knowledge of uh, local Australian ingredients. Um, and then kind of our bigger picture, bigger plan is we need to be able to feed more people using less resources. And there's no point in us really um, uh, producing all of this amazing insect protein and then having to fly it overseas. So what we will be doing is establishing um, our circular farming systems in key locations around the world so that we can um, convert their local food waste streams back into their food system as a usable source of protein, which is very, very exciting. Um, I you supply more products to domestication food chain these days? Is it your input for insect science? Yeah, so um, uh, so one of the questions was based around our, um, uh, the waste products that we're using. So we have very specific um, sources. So these will generally be um, organic food manufacturers as well as organic farms as well. We don't want any insecticides in our farm because obviously we're farming insects, so we don't want the insecticides to kill our insects. Um, all of the food product that comes onto our site is tested to make sure that that's not going to be an issue for us. Um, then we also have a system where we feed um, different colonies of crickets or mealworms um, different batches of food. So if there is a problem with one batch of food, it isn't actually um, uh, a big deal because it's only a small amount of insects that's been, um, uh, been exposed to that kind of food as well. Um, we don't actually supply any product overseas at the moment, so we're just starting to export. Um, and that's fantastic because it means that Australians actually have this really, really big appetite for sustainable foods. Um, and we sell out just within Australia to every, like mums and dads and kids, which is fantastic. Like my kids probably eat about half of everything that we produce themselves. <laughs> which is pretty good though because um, I have some very picky eaters but they'll eat bugs so um, which is kind of strange to me but um, yeah definitely if anybody's got any questions you can either um, unblock yourself and uh, just ask the question if you don't have your chat bubble up there um, and I'll just pause for a minute so anybody can definitely feel free and I've got my contact info coming up on the next slide as well if that's because I noticed a couple of those. Thanks for that. Now, Ali, you've had your hand up and waited patiently. Would you like to go ahead? Yes, um, I'm finding this fascinating and didn't realise quite how extensively you've managed to uh, market this. I work in the community garden space and we are very into recycling, composting and I can see that this is something that people would like to try. What is your advice for small scale insect farming, um, for instance, in a community garden? Is it too hard or what would it take? No, so definitely steer away from crickets. So the crickets are a bit more finicky. If you're looking for something for a community garden, there's lots of resources available on mealworm farming. Mealworms aren't as picky about what they eat. Um, they're not noisy and um, they're not as difficult to look after. So um, definitely have a little bit of a search around on the internet. It, it's very, very easy. There's lots of information about farming mealworms at home. Um, and then that's easily converted 
converted into um, like a community garden kind of situation. And um, my kids have a little, instead of a worm farm where we take our food scraps, we have a little mealworm farm at home and they um, put all their, you know, fruit peelings and vegetable peelings that they're having inside that, inside that and then they get little mealworm snacks out of it, which they really love. They like um, salt and vinegar mealworms or sometimes they make them chocolate chip cookies that have mealworms in them as well and they're part of the process they know um where their food is coming from and i feel like that's something that's really important for young people is to know that you know their food comes from animals um their food comes from uh farms and it gets processed in lots of different ways as well so um so yeah definitely if you're looking at a community garden kind of situation um the the mealworms would definitely be the way to go but steer away from the crickets they're a bit hard <laughs> okay i guess they'd be noisy too yeah they are a bit noisy and they attract lots of um uh, like other things that like to eat them because they are so noisy. So you'll have lots more birds coming by and frogs and things like that that want to eat the crickets. <laughs> Some people might like that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sky. Thank you. Sky, I noticed that Jerry was asking, do you have other people um, farming insects for you? Um, we don't at the moment. We just have our own um, insect farm. So because we are moving more towards um, like an automated process, there is still the opportunity for people to um, come and contract farming on kind of small numbers for us. But because we are moving to an automated system um, to bring the price down, kind of the amount of man hours that goes in um, – is kind of a little bit hard to, harder to justify the the larger price tag now because we do have the opportunity to scale um, with the robotics and the robotics is very very expensive to put into place so it's kind of a two-sided coin we really do want people to farm more insects and we do have um, the opportunity for people to join us and do that which is fantastic but um, when we're looking at feeding the world um, we're not looking at being able to feed a little bit of people, we're really looking at feed, like doing 10 tonnes of cricket protein every week, which is um, like a huge task, as you can imagine. <laughs> Definitely. Um, now, we've got somebody asking if you can expand facilities into regional New South Wales. Um, not at the moment, but we always are looking for new sites. So at the moment, we are um, located close to a lot of, uh, food manufacturers because we take a lot of you know um, like skins and peels and pulp and things like that directly from the food manufacturers so um, being close to those kinds of areas is one of our key requirements so if there are food manufacturers in uh, more regional um, places where we can get that waste stream then definitely it's something that we would look at. Fantastic. We've got a question here from Ian Shepherd. A fantastic presentation. Do you work with a large team of engineers to get the tech right? And how long did it take you to go from the concept to having a working robot? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, so as I said, we're all scientists, yeah. So um, we actually did all the engineering ourselves, which has taken us a very long time to get it right. Um, which, uh, you know, the market wasn't ready for a cricket farming robot or for these products to be on shelves 10 years ago. So it's fantastic that we've had the opportunity to be able to kind of um, develop our robot, grow while the market has been growing. And now that we've had the time to be able to develop all the tech, that the market has kind of caught up with our way of thinking and we can implement it. So, um, yeah, it's it's really exciting because, you, as you can imagine, it's been a very long-term project. <laughs> We've got Janet with her hand up. Janet, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, Sky, just the physical, mechanical side of things, um, with the crickets, how do you remove their, how does the machine remove their wings and legs? And secondly, with the mealworms, how does it remove their less digestible exoskeleton? No, so we actually use the whole insect. So we're using the legs. So basically when we're making, we, we have a few different kinds of processes, but just as an example, when we're making a cricket protein powder, we remove the moisture out of the crickets. Um, 
uh, from being whole, the moisture, that doesn't actually get wasted. That gets turned into a cricket milk product. So the cricket milk product's got four times the amount of calcium as cow milk in it. And we can make like cheese, um, yogurt, ice cream, things like that. Um, then we've got the solid part, which is a lot of the um, where the protein is and a lot of the nutrients are as well. So basically we dry that out so that it's got a really low water activity and then we grind it up into a really fine powder. So there's not a lot that goes into that kind of process, but we are using the whole insect. And that's the same with the, um, the mealworms. So when we have the mealworms, they're um, a lot higher in a lot of um, uh, like the good fats and they're very oily. So we can actually extract oil from them that you can use for cooking or a salad dressing that's really high in omega-3 and omega-6, which is awesome. Um, and uh, then the exoskeleton will then get turned into a powdered kind of products that you can use um, in other kinds of foods as well. So none of the animal is actually getting wasted. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, just a further question related to mealworms. Uh, mealworms, if I remember rightly, are relatively high in fat compared to some other worms. And I'm thinking of, for example, silkworms are particularly high in protein, low in fat. Yeah. Have you considered trying silkworms as an alternative to mealworms? Yeah, so we do farm silkworms. Um, the because we want to be as sustainable as we possibly can be. Obviously, silkworms only eat mulberry trees. So to farm the silkworms, we need a supply of mulberry trees. With the mealworms, we can actually feed them on the fruit and vegetable waste. They're not as picky about what they're eating. Um, also, when we're looking at the types of insects that we're farming, because we want to hide the nutrition in these familiar kinds of foods we want insects that are really low in taste low in texture and low in color so that means that the um if you've actually tried silkworms before they actually have a very foresty kind of green grassy flavor to them which you can't really hide so um even though they are high in protein and low in fat um you can actually taste them if you put it into like a corn chip or something like that. You'd be able to taste that. And to a consumer, any unfamiliar um, unfamiliar flavour would generally be a negative flavour if they know that it's made out of insects. So it's better just to have no difference in flavour at all, if that kind of makes sense. But the types of um, fats and stuff that are found in mealworms are actually good fats too. So they're, it's not saturated fats. So that means that um, it's actually good for us to eat. And that's why we actually choose mealworms to extract the cooking oil out of. Thank you very much. Good answer. Thank you. I can honestly say that it's very yummy. I had some hummus made with the oil and it was delicious. It just, it just tastes like hummus, right? <laughs> yeah, it was really, really good. Um, now, are you exploring with other species of insects? Yeah, so we are always, always, always part of our research is definitely because, as I said, we're all scientists, so we're all into research. We're researching lots of things all the time. One of the things that is a very um, a, a passion project of ours is looking at different kinds of insects to commercialise. So that includes Australian native insects. Um, the problem that we have with a lot of Australian native insects is that they have very complex life cycles. They need very specific conditions or they also have very long life cycles. So, for instance, um, to get a witchetty grub to a stage where you would eat it, it takes between five and seven years. So realistically, if I'm going to sell a witchetty grub that we've looked after for five to seven years, um, how much would you need to charge for that item to justify it? Also, um, they we can't farm them in a sustainable way. It nearly kills a whole tree to be able to farm a, um, a witchetty grub. So, but we are looking at different kinds of Australian native crickets, Australian native grasshoppers, because they have kind of similar um, processes to what we're used to with our species of cricket that we use. Fantastic. So interesting. I have lots of termites here. You're welcome to have. <laughs> They're delicious. They're very full of iron. So definitely head out into the garden and get those. <laughs> um, now we would like to, we can keep taking questions. Um, we would like your um, 
to fill out a few polls for us to help us um, in the future to look at perhaps innovative practices that you'd like to learn more about or sustainable farming systems. So please take a few minutes to answer the polls that will pop up on your screen. And I do have some wonderful products here to be able to um, send out to some of our participants. Um, I've got lemon myrtle mealworms. I've got marshmallows. Um, what else have we got? Barbecue cricket chips. Oh, I think you've got some ant candy there as well. Yes, I do. I've got uh, real ant candy and I've got the lollipops. Yeah, and some of the chips, I think. Chips we've got. Yeah. Um, this is my favourite, salt bush and rosemary. Yeah. Um, and there's a plain and there's a barbecue. The, bar the barbecue is my favourite flavour, I have to say. And then I get in trouble every time I do these events. We have a big rush on barbecue flavoured corn chips. And then all my staff like, stop telling people that barbecue is the best flavour because we've run out of barbecue <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? They are the best flavour. So don't, just don't tell anybody that I told you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Now, do we have any more questions? Or um, And I've also got some I Love Farmer shirts to go out today, um, thanks to National Ag Day. So if you want to drop a line or two in the chat or um, send me an email, I'd be happy to post one off. Sky's going to get one. I just got them too late to get her one for today. I need, I'm totally into t-shirts. That's my thing. I wear t-shirts every day. So I'll be going to school with that one on. I was just saying um, I've got one that um, I got made that has Bug Patrol on it instead of Paw Patrol. And it has a converted Paw Patrol logo on it to have a bug on the inside. And parents don't get it, but I get a lot of children come up to me and love my shirt because they do recognise the Paw Patrol logo, but with that little bug in the middle instead. <laughs> <laughs> Real popular. Yeah. I'm I'm popular with with the kids, <laughs> with my yeah. Um any other questions? I think that when just, I heard um, just, I, I've just I, I've just got a quick question. Um yeah. I'm just sort of drawing a long straw here. Butterf butterfly sky, did you run a a butterfly website? Yep, yep. Yeah. So we actually have an education business as well that, um, as I said, we go out to schools and teach kids all about the importance of um, insects in our environment. So um, we've got like giant burrowing cockroaches and millipedes and tarantulas and things like that that we take out to schools and teach the kids all about the importance of all these kinds of animals in our ecosystems. Yeah, so it's a, a sort of a Pat on the back. I remember seeing your website about two, three years ago. I was looking at it in detail. <laughs> we, we've had that website for a very long time, probably about 20 years. So, um, yeah, but uh, we still do a lot of uh, like life cycle kits that go into schools as well. So instead of them raising chickens and things, they can actually raise butterflies and see the life cycle of the butterflies. Now I can draw the link and complete the circle. Yes, good one. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. And we've got in, in principle, ed, ed, education of the next generation is very important. I do similar with reptiles. Yeah, definitely. And we feel like um, education is so important and that's why we spend um, so much time. And this year, Science Week was all about the future of food. So as you can imagine, um, we had so many schools. We saw about 300,000 school students within um, a four week period. And because we were in um, coronavirus lockdown, it was actually a really good opportunity for us because um, we got to see so many more students because we didn't need to travel we just developed an online program for them um, and yeah we had a really really good response so we've been doing our online program for quite a long time now um, probably three or four years but we kind of had to like make the push and move all of our presentations to online so um, yeah which which is fantastic because this, the kids still get kind of that interactivity we actually send them out bugs in the post directly to their house so they get the excitement of receiving something in the post for a change um, and they get to try insects um, all together but just in a virtual way. 
Got somebody with their hand up there, or is that an other one? Yeah, hi. It's Barry here. Um, I put in a note earlier about marketing and branding, particularly for your cricket products, and I mentioned Meg Lanning, um, um, Bradman, and and the male and female Healy's. But I also thought if, if you want to put in some of the spices, you could also uh, uh, <laughs> market it towards the Indian and the Pakistan and the West Indies with... <laughs> We actually, don't tell anybody, we've actually got a promotion coming up for crickets at the cricket. And um, in 2015, we actually did um, Shark Tank. And that was the ad that they had on all summer. There was a guy watching cricket and he was eating our crickets while he was watching the cricket. <laughs> and all summer long, they had this ad on for cr what's the new snack at the crickets. It's crickets at the cricket. So we'll actually take, keep an eye out for that one because you will be seeing crickets at the cricket. <laughs> right. There's a winner. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bugby, Bugby Union, Bugby League. <laughs> well, we do have Christmas coming up, so. <laughs> I should be your ma marketing consultant. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Welcome. Well, I'll try and get as many products out to all of you as I can. Um, they all arrived yesterday, so it was great to have them on board with us today. Um, and we're just, uh, we're all right on time. Is there any last question? I can see Ian Shepherd's perhaps typing, maybe not. Um, yep, he is. Thanks, Sky and Liz. I'm looking forward to the cricket season this summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's cricket season all year round at my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sky. It's been wonderful, and I, I'm just going to keep spreading the word on on um, Circle Harvest. I think it's a wonderful um, uh, industry that you set up. And I think the last time we were talked, you were getting starting in South Africa, was it? You were going overseas that way. Um, yeah, yeah. So we actually do, we're doing um, disaster kits. So um, if there is uh, like some kind of natural disaster or a war area where they don't have access to food, we can actually drop ship a, a starter insect farm that's in kind of like a shipping container. Um, and it has everything that they need to be able to produce protein for their um, for their communities using their local food waste. So that's, some, that's something that we do as well. <laughs> Wow, we'll have to have a session on that. That sounds really amazing. Thanks, Liz. And um, I hope everybody will join me and thanks, Guy, for this. It's been wonderful. Really enjoy it so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Look for you. Thanks your very much. Well done, Liz. What was that, Scott? Just thank you, thanking you for putting on our little cricket show. Thanks. <laughs> No worries, Scott. Thanks for coming. And you know what you guys can do? Um, as I said, like what we love to educate people. So if you guys have learned something new today, you can go out and spread the word and tell people about the future of food and insect protein and all the things that you've kind of learned about today. And that's one of the, the easiest things that you can do that doesn't cost you anything. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Bye.